most of you are in Istanbul, so um, good morning. Um, so my name's Jamie Coleman. I'm a software developer and advocate for IBM. Um, and yeah, sorry, I can't be there in person. Again, I really, really wanted to travel to Istanbul. It's a city that I've always wanted to go to. Um, but yeah, for certain reasons, I couldn't, couldn't be there um, with you today or tomorrow. So let me just share my screen and then we can get started. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. Okay, so today I'm going to be, um, like I mentioned, I'm a developer advocate for IBM. Um, I've worked mainly on containerization technologies, um, but my focus is generally Java. So today I want to talk to you about some simple tweaks you can use to get the most out of the JVM you're using. Um, and what I'll do, I'll start with, I'll talk a little bit about why the JVM is important, how the cloud has changed the JVM over the years. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a brief overview of some of the main JVMs we use, such as Hotspot, OpenJ9, and GraalVM. Um, then I'm going to move on to picking the right runtime for your JVM, um, how you can do different tweaks to your JVM. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what class cache sharing is. Um, this is not just an OpenJ9 specific technology. It is um, usable in other JVMs. Then I'll talk a little bit about idle tuning in the JIT server. And then a new technology, um, Cryu, um, which stands for Create and Restore in User Space. Um, and hopefully I can get a little demo done today, um, just depending on the time we have. Um, I can hear someone's microphone. Um, I don't know if you can just quickly mute it's coming through on, on my end. Um, OK, so let's get started. Why the JVM is important? Well, first of all, without the JVM, we wouldn't have Java. Um, Java has been around for, what, 27 years now. So the JVM has been around just as long. Um, so what does a JVM do? Well, first of all, a JVM is the Java virtual machine. And it's responsible for taking your application bytecode and converting it into machine languages for execution. So most other languages compile code for a specific system, but in Java, the compiler converts code for the Java virtual machine, and that can be used on any system. Hence the phrase that we use with Java, write once, run anywhere. So why do people use JVMs? Why do we use Java at all? Um, well, first of all, it's cross-platform. So like I said, write once, run anywhere. So we can um, essentially take our code and run it on pretty much any system. It has a very large ecosystem library, and that's because Java has been around, like I said, for about 27 years now. Um, it's got a great garbage collector, which handles a lot of the stuff we, we don't want to have to care about as developers. It's got some great monitoring tools. And it is proven, proven and robust. It has been around for 27 years. Um, it's been used by the biggest enterprises in the world, and it's still used by the biggest enterprises in the world. And let's hope um, Java is going to be around for another 27 years to come. Uh, Jamie, you're on mute. You're, yes, your microphone is mute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Hopefully yes, you yes. can. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Was I muted for the whole time or just now? Just now. Okay, cool. Okay. That wasn't me. I, I was in my presentation, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, back to the presentation. Okay. So um where was I? Oh, yeah. So again, I'm not a JVM expert. Um, I'm just a normal Java developer that uses the JVM. But I started thinking, because um, IBM has its own JVM, which we open sourced, OpenJ9, which is summary runtimes. I'll talk about that later. But I started thinking about um, energy conservation and how we as Java developers can get the most out of our JVM, which led me to start doing research into how JVMs work and different things we can do as developers to get the most out of our JVMs. So I'll talk very briefly about the JVM architecture. So this is all from research I've been doing. So you kind of have your class subload, uh, class loader subsystem, which is the first part of your JVM. Then it kind of moves down to your runtime data area. And then you kind of have your execution area. So I'll try and cover very, very briefly about what these do. So the class loader subsystem, this is responsible for loading, linking, and initialization. So the loading part loads classes using three different class loaders. You have the bootstrap, extension, and the application class loaders. 
uh, linking does verifying of the generated bytecode. It prepares all the static variables and assigns default values and resolves any symbolic uh, memory references. Initialization, on the other hand, assigns static variables with their original values and then executes the static block. So the runtime data area is, as it says, is responsible more for the runtime data things. So the method area stores metadata, constant runtime pool, and the code for your methods. The heap uses um, a common memory shared between multiple threads, and this stores things like objects, instant variables, and arrays. The JVM language stacks um, are created when a thread is created, and this stores your local variables. The PC registers are created every um, for every thread. It has its own register, and this stores the address of the Java virtual machine instructions, which are currently being executed. Uh, the native method stack, this holds uh, native method information. So for every uh, thread, this is created, and so is a native method stack. So on to the final part of uh, my very, very brief overview of what a JVM is and what it does. Um, so you've got your execution engine. This reads bytecode and executes it, executes it using the interpreter and the JIT compiler. The native method interface, so the JNI, this interacts with the native method libraries to provide the required libraries for the execution engine. And the native method libraries um, are a collection of essentially, as it says, native method libraries. So let's have a talk a little bit about how the cloud has changed JVMs over time. So I, again, this is why this is something more closer to my heart. As as developers, um, we tend we so we're told you know we need to make our applications more robust, more efficient to save money on the cloud. Um, but for us as developers, it's not actually saving us any money. We're saying yes, we're saving our organisations money but it doesn't actually impact us directly. So this is something that I've tried to switch around a little bit. When these cloud providers set up their data centers, once they've spent the money buying the hardware and the bill, Jamie, again, can you, can you hear me? Again, I unmuted. You, you can unmute yourself. It's about the tool. Sorry for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 yes. No problem. We All can right. hear you now. Good. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on here, guys. Um, okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, so what I was trying to say is once your data center set up, once a data center is set up, the main cost for the data center providers is energy, electricity. We have to power these things. Um, so for us as developers, yes, saving our organization's money is a good thing. But what we what is really more important or more um, hits more to home is trying to save energy, um, and by you know making our applications more efficient, we are essentially helping you know the planet try and save a bit of energy. So what the cloud offers? Imagine this is your local data center in your organization. Now the problem is with this is we have to have the resources to handle max capacity or just above what we think max capacity is because we don't want our customers to essentially not be able to access our services. But the problem is with this is most of the time, a lot of that hardware is being completely wasted um, because we're not sharing that with other people around the world. That is just you know generally for our organization. So if we take, say we move to the cloud now um, with say a monolith or something like that, as you can see now, we are freeing up some of those resources for other people around the world to use. And I guarantee these cloud providers, they're trying to save as much money as possible. So they are probably a lot more efficient than what we are doing, sorry, um, in, our in basically our own data centers. So moving to the cloud, not only can we possibly save some uh, money because we don't have to bu keep buying new hardware to deal with uh, maximum capacity, but we're also freeing up those resources for other people around the world to use. Now, if we go to a more smaller architecture like um, functions as a service or microservices, we have more granular control and we're using smaller computes um, kind of modules. So we can then free up more and more resources for other people to use and also hopefully save our organizations um, a bit of money in the uh, process. So microservices in the JVM. So microservices are great, um, but there is a bit of a problem with Java and microservices. 
So before we were using containers and we were using the cloud and we were using microservices, JVMs had a bit of a different role. Um, traditionally, we would have a JVM with lots and lots of applications running on one JVM or a big kind of monolith. So we were really utilizing that layer of the JVM to get the most out of it. Whereas today we are basically running in a container, we've got our OS level, we have our JVM level, then we have our runtime and our application. Now, that is a very one-to-one -one kind of relationship nowadays. And it's kind of a bit of a big overhead with Java, the fact that we have to have a JVM in every microservice. And when we get to the point where we've got hundreds or thousands of microservices, that's quite a big overhead. So what um, JVM providers and creators have been doing and engineers are trying to make them more efficient and trying to basically get the balance perfect. Now, the problem is with this is you change one characteristic of the JVM and it might have detrimental effects on other characteristics. So for example, I could reduce startup time, but that might increase say response time or ramp up time or CPU usage. So trying to get the balance of these metrics is quite difficult. Um, but like I said, lots of JVMs have, um, and the developers have stood up to the challenge and they are basically constantly innovating um, to make these JVNs more and more cloud efficient. So they fit in this kind of cloud native kind of architecture with microservices a lot better. So um, I can't see your hands because I'm not there in person, unfortunately, but um, I hope you would have all seen or at least had one of these. I think this is the second mobile phone I ever had. Um, great mobile phone. If you remember the battery life was like a week or more. Um, you could throw it out of a five-story building, go downstairs and pick it up. <laughs> It'd still be working. Um, but these phones, they, they had a Java Me um, inside of them. So if we look at the requirements for Java Me, um, there was things like small footprints, uh, fast startup, and quick immediate ramp up. So if we think of things like the game Snake, um, we want that game to start up instantly. We don't want the, the little snake at the beginning to be juddering and not going where it needs to go. Imagine you're playing um, a game like Call of Duty. You don't want the first few minutes of your game where the game's all juddering and you know you can't play the game. So um, these were the kind of requirements that we had you know, in, in the past for this phone. Now, the difference was back then, um, it was more the hardware limitations that were forcing these requirements. Whereas nowadays, we pretty much, the hardware is not limited anymore. We can scale it up as much as we want, especially on the cloud. Um, but then it comes more to cost. So as you can see, the requirements for um, Java Me, so on these old phones, compared to JVMs in the cloud is pretty similar. Um, again, small footprint. We want to basically run it as small as possible to save money. And again, more to heart, we want to save energy. Um, fast startup. I mean, the time it takes your application to start up, it's pretty much, you know, unusable resources at that point until the application, since you click start or you, you, you know, you get deploy your application, that one second, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, that time is pretty much completely wasted. So we want our application to start up very, very quickly. And again, with quick immediate ramp up. Um, so not only do they start up, but we want the full JVM, the that layer underneath to be fully usable, to have the throughput it, it's designed to have from, from the get-go. So when we deploy our applications, uh, just checking the time. Okay, we're all good. So again, going back to why developers should care about saving money on our applications. So I'll throw some facts at you here. Um, there's over half a million data centers worldwide. Um, and these do include the data centers that we have in our organizations. Um, so next to my office, we have quite a large data center. Um, so there are a lot of them all over the world. They consume the land of around 6,000 football pitches. Um, if there's any Americans here, that's soccer pitches. Um, don't get it confused with American football. So they consume quite a lot of land, these data centers. And remember, we can't see these data centers. Um, they're just there. Um, everyone around the world is using them when they use, say, Facebook or Twitter or all these different applications. All that data is being you know, processed in these humongous data centers. And if we look at the energy consumption of them, you take the whole of the United Kingdom's energy consumption, times that by 1.5, and that is the current, well, that is the global data center energy consumption in 2019. So a lot of energy. Now, luckily, the hardware engineers of the world, thank you guys, um, you are doing your best to essentially 
um, basically curve that trend. So if we look from 2010, if hardware stayed on the same track of energy efficiency, we would be using uh, nearly three times the energy um, in our data centers. So remember, currently data centers are using one and a half times the UK's energy consumption. Imagine if the hardware engineers hadn't done their part to curb that trend. We would be using mass amounts of energy right now. Um, but they have done their, their job and they've done it very well, so thank you. Um, but it's now our responsibility as software engineers to do our part, to make our applications more and more efficient. So not only can we stop that trend going up, because I mean, it's going to go up. There's always going to be more applications. There's always going to be more people using the internet. But we need to basically do our part to reduce that as much as possible. So let's quickly have a look at some of the main JVMs that are available. Um, so there is pretty much a JVM for everything. Um, so these are just a few of the JVMs that are out there. Um, I love the Squawk VM. I think that's a cool name. Um, I think you've got the Wonka VM. Uh, reminds me of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And of course, the main ones, a lot of the main ones we use. Uh, there's even ones for IoT devices like Jam VM, also, also an amazing name. Um, the Maxine JVM, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but I think that's kind of where Graal originated. Um, but yeah, lots of different JVMs um, around and pretty much for kind of any need you want. So the most popular JVMs out there, I'd say, would be the Oracle JDK. Um, you've got OpenJDK, which you can say Amazon, Oracle, um, Adopt. Um, of course, you've got the Microsoft JDK. Um, Azure will have an amazing JDK as well. Um, Graal VM. Call it a JVM, it, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but I, for, for what I'm talking about here, I'm just going to call it a JVM. Uh, and of course, you've got the Eclipse Open J9 JVM, which uh, was IBM's JVM. Um, that is now, um, so that is now on the Eclipse Adoption Marketplace. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but that is now been renamed to Semaru Runtimes. But that is just, the Semaru Runtimes is kind of the supported offering. It is, you can get it for free, um, but that is based on the um, Open J9 technology. So let's do an overview of um, three of the make three of the main JVMs. So a bit of an overview of Hotspot. Um, everyone will know this JVM. It's been around for quite a long time. Um, original release in 1999, as you can see. And this was what Sun created, um, which Oracle now own. And um, in uh, the 13th of November 2006, that is when um, Oracle um, open sourced this JVM. And um, they open sourced it to the community. And this kind of paved the way for all these different people to essentially go and create their own flavors of the JVM. And essentially, it's called Hotspot because what it does is continually analyze um, your program's performance for hotspots. Um, and these are executed often or repeatedly. And these are then targeted for optimization, leading to high performance execution with a minimum overhead of less performance critical code. So we'll move on to the OpenJ9 JVM. Um, this was, uh, again, this was IBM's JVM. Um, it's the, if you have ever bought a, um, a product or an offering from IBM um, that's using Java, then you would generally have got support for this JVM underneath. Um, it's gone through a lot of changes over the last 10 years, I'd say, generally because of the way and the characteristics of now how we're using JVMs. Like I said, that kind of one-to-one -one relationship when we're using microservices. Um, it, we have very small flavors of this, and there's very large flavors of the Open J, uh, J9 JVM, and it can hand constrained environments or very and works really well in memory rich ones. And I'll explain what I mean about that later. Um, but going back to the whole point of JVMs and Java, um, this is a very very robust JVM. It's been used by the largest enterprises on the planet for over 20 years, um, so it is a really 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 good choice of a JVM. Now, here's some stats which I pulled off the OpenJ9 website, and this is comparing um, OpenJ9 with um, Hotspot. So, for example, you can see fast, nearly 51% um, faster startup time. And again, these things do really matter in this kind of cloud native world. 50% um, smaller footprint after startup, um, faster ramp up time. So, like I said, the time it takes for our, our applications and our JVM to get to where they need to be. And um, that's important because um we again that's pretty much wasted time or wasted energy and wasted resources because um we're we're renting these resource compute resources out regardless so we want to utilize them as quick as possible rather than you know slowly and it's got 33 percent smaller footprint during load um which 
which won't save your organization possibly much money because you're paying for a, a unit of resources, but it will save energy. So that to me is quite important. Um, like I mentioned, this has just recently happened over the last few days. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, go to the Adoption Marketplace. It's an amazing way to get your hands on lots of different flavors of JVM. Um, there's the Red Hat one, there's the IBM one, um, Azure's on there. Um, I'm pretty sure Microsoft's on there, but I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, do go check out um, the uh, Adoption Marketplace. It only went live, I think, a few days ago, or at least I think Semery Runtimes only went live on there a few days ago. But yeah, do check it out because it's a really simple way to get your hands on lots of different, of, uh, lots of different flavors of JVMs. So a little bit of overview of Growl. Now, I'm not an expert in Growl, so I'll try my best to talk about this. Um, but this is based on the Hotspot Open JDK, but it has its roots, and I mentioned this earlier, in the Maxine Virtual Machine, which was developed by Oracle and also the University of Manchester in the UK. Now, this was developed quite, quite a while ago. Um, the project wasn't abandoned, but um, it was kind of left because at the time, um, there wasn't as much need for these kind of cloud native technologies in the way we were deploying our applications. But now with the introduction of the cloud and containers and, you know, these smaller, these, you know, compute resources where we want to try and save as much money, then this technology became a lot, lot more interesting and viable to implement. So why is the Growl um, JVM or VM, sorry, um, it, why is it different to normal JVMs? Well, it has a new JIT compiler for Java, um, which is called the Growl VM compiler. It allows ahead of time compilation of Java applications with the Growl VM native image. Um, it has something called Truffle Language Implementation Framework um, and the Growl VM SDK, which basically allow, allows you to enable additional programming language runtimes. Um, and it also has support for LLVM and JavaScript runtime. So very, very cool. Um, the goals really of um, Growl VM were to improve the performance of the Java virtual machine based languages because to match more like um, native languages like um, like Python and things like that, for example. Um, again, we wanted to reduce the startup time of JVM based applications and th this is done by compiling them ahead of time with Growl VM. Um, we also wanted to enable, well, they wanted to enable uh, the Growl VM integration into things like Oracle databases, OpenJDK, Node.js, et cetera, um, to allow the freedom of mixing of code, so polyglot applications, and to essentially include an easily extended set of polyglot programming tools. Because I think, um, yes, you can make everything in Java, but there are certain languages that might be more suitable to something you're trying to do. And again, the project goals of this were to now enable you to kind of use lots of languages all in one, all in kind of one application. So it doesn't matter really um, kind of what's, what JVM you pick at this time, at this point, because if you are using a runtime which is not meant for what you're trying to do, then a lot of this is gonna be completely wasted effort. So I'm going to introduce you to two runtimes from IBM, um, both open source. So first of all, Open Liberty. Um, open Liberty was um, open sourced, I think, about five or six years ago. Trust me when I say that was I took a lot of convincing to <laughs> IBM sales uh, people to get that done. Um, but Liberty was created in a way that we really wanted to focus on um, developers. We wanted a uh, runtime that was essentially, you know, very easy to use, pleasant to use, had everything you needed, but also on the cloud ready side. So just enough application server. Um, by that, I mean, it's, you know, it's very small when you add in the functionality you want to grow it. Um, a fast inner loop with dev mode, which allows you to basically start the runtime, not have to care about the runtime. So you can make code changes, configuration changes, and even test code changes um, without having to ever, you know, restart the runtime. Um, and that makes you a lot more productive as a developer because you can you can code away um, and then those changes go live instantly. Um, again, support for lots of industry standards, stuff like Jakarta EE, um, MicroProfile and Spring. And we've always had this um, since Open Liberty was created. We had this policy and we really wanted to stick to this. It's been very difficult, but we have stuck to it um, of a zero migration policy. So in traditionally with, say, traditional web sphere and things like that, we have a lot of customers and users that are on super, super old versions. Um, and that's annoying for us. We have 350 people in WebSphere working on all these different things. And to have people stuck on versions that are 10 years old, 15 years old, 
it's frustrating not only for them because they're all, you know using very old technology but it's frustrating to us because it means they're not using all the new goodness that we put into these technologies um, so with Open Liberty, we had this policy that if you take your code and move up to the latest version, it won't break. Um, and that is the problem, you know, of a lot of people. It's very difficult to move to the latest version because you might have to change your application code. Um, yeah, and lots of different things. So having this policy um, is, is key to Open Liberty. And again, um, cloud ready, so it's optimized for containers. I think this was one of the first things that was ever containerized at IBM. Um, that was my first job when I joined. Um, Docker was, I think it just become a thing. Um, my, I remember my manager saying, have you heard of Docker? I was like, nope, no idea what you're talking about. He's like, okay, what I want you to do is figure out what Docker does um, and test, play around with it and basically try and containerize, you know, um, open liberty. So uh, WebSphere liberty at the time. Um, so that was my first job. Um, designed, it's designed for DevOps. It's got a very small footprint, very efficient memory usage. Um, again, fast startup, which is very key. Um, high throughput, which is definitely important. Um, so if you do check out Open Liberty, you can basically, if you're using Spring Boot, you can swap Open Liberty in and you can check out the performance benefits you get with that. I think nearly the throughput is, is nearly double. So if you can imagine with containers on the cloud, um, if you're using um, if you've got double the throughput, hopefully you'd need half the containers to do the same job using half the resources, um, saving money and also energy. It's also got a self-tuned thread pool, so you don't really have to care about that. Um, it just makes it very, the thread pool very, very efficient. So like I mentioned, just enough application server, very small. You add in the features you want um, rather than just having you know, a runtime with everything in from the get go. Like I mentioned, we're trying to support as many APIs as possible. Um, we were the first to commercially support for Java EE7, first to support Java EE8, um, first to certify for Jakarta EE8 and Jakarta EE9. And we were also the first to deliver um, a lot of the different micro profile um, implementations. And trust me, that is, it takes a lot of work to do that. Um, so now I'm going to move on to Quarkus. Um, Quarkus is an amazing, amazing runtime as well. Um, this is um, from Red Hat. You probably all know what Quarkus is. Um, unified configuration to make it very simple to get going. Um, zero config with live reload. So very, very similar to what we have with Open Liberty with dev mode. Um, it has native execution, so you can use this with Graal VM as well. And it has support for many libraries such as MicroProfile and Spring and things like that. Um, so here's just some performance stats of um, Quarkus. So you've probably seen some of these um, before. But as you can see, I'm using Quarkus with Grohl. Um, you can get very, very, very efficient um, startup and response times. And this is really, really key for things like functions as a service and things like that. Um, but yep, I've just mentioned the two um, that are closer to me, of course. IBM and Red Hat work very closely together. Um, but there are lots of different other runtimes available. Um, so it's really up to you as developers to figure out what you're building and what runtime makes sense for your kind of architecture and your application styles. Just take the time. Yep, I think we're all good. So on to kind of tweaking the JVM. Um, again, more to what this talk's about. So these are the main five points, I think, to get really the most out of your JVM. Um, first of all, as developers, we need to write efficient code. That is first and foremost. Um, it doesn't matter what JVM you pick, what runtime you pick, et cetera. If your code is not efficient, then you're not going to get the most out of your JVM. Um, again, you need to pick the right JVM for what you need. Like I showed before, there are lots of different JVMs out there that do lots of different things. So um, picking the right one is very important. You also need to pick the right runtime for what you're doing. So um, Open Liberty is great from monoliths down to all the way down to microservices. And then Quarkus is great for mo uh, microservices down to things like function as a service. Um, profiling is really cool. And again, it's something I've not really looked at until I started doing the research for this talk. Um, profiling allows you to essentially dive into your JVM to see exactly what's going on. Um, it's very interesting to see what's going on in there. Again, as a Java developer, I've never really cared too much about what the JVM is doing. I more care about my application code. So using pro different profilers to see what's going on is very cool. And also, the different JVMs have different technologies which you can use. Um, so looking at the JVM you're using, um, or just looking at what all the JVMs offer in regards to this, um, you should tweak your JVM to get the most out of your needs. Now, this can be a bit different to development and production. And um, there might be tweaks you can do to your JVM in development that you might not want to do in production and vice versa. 
So do just have a look at what, your, what the different JVMs offer and the different technologies you can take advantage of. And really that's all kind of down to um, Java being open source and the JVM being open sourced. So number one, writing efficient code. Um, use primitives where possible. Uh, these are a lot more efficient. Um, use a string builder rather than a string buffer. Now a string builder um, is a lot more efficient than a string buffer, but it's not thread safe. So it does depend on what you're trying to do. Um, try avoid using iterators because they're not the most efficient things in the world. Um, and basically if you're using integers, um, there's no point like over exaggerating what you'll need. So if you're using a big integer and big decimal, these are a lot um, less efficient than just using a plain integer. So do have a look at your code, do have a look at what you're trying to use and don't use, you know, um, variables and things like that, that, you know, are inefficient if it's not necessary to do so. Like I mentioned, use the right JVM for your needs. Um, there's lots of different JVMs out there. So um, you can get JVMs for obviously Adopt Open JDK. But if you go to, for example, um, the Adoption Marketplace, there is loads of different JVMs you can get from there very, very easily. Um, going back to picking the right runtime for your needs. So like I mentioned, um, so Web Server Application Server, it's been around for quite a while now, I think 25 years. Um, it, does do what it says on the tin. I mean, we have customers that have been running these run these application servers without shutting them down for about 15 years. Um, but traditional WebSphere is not great for this cloud native world. It's very big, you know, gigabytes in size. Um, at the start at time, you know, it takes quite a while to start up and you really do kind of need sysadmin help to kind of configure it. Um, which is not great for us as developers because if I've got my code, I just want to test it. I don't want to have to care about what the runtime's doing. So this is where Open Liberty is great because it pretty much has all the functionality of traditional web sphere. So it can scale from say a monolith down to a microservice. Now I'll explain what I consider a macro service. Um, it's kind of something that maybe I, I kind of invented a little bit or I've just kind of seen around, but a macro service is kind of a, a, a state where I see as that people get to when they try and break apart their monolith. Um, it's not a distributed monolith. That what well, that's what I would call a, a well-architected monolith. Um, but a macro service is when they try and break apart a monolith and they realize some services are so highly coupled together that to break them apart would take so much effort that they end up keeping. So you've got your big monolith, but they keep some of them together, which still has benefits. So especially on the cloud, because it means yes, you you are scaling bigger services, but Generally, if they are quite highly coupled, you might need to scale those services together anyway. Um, but then you go down to microservices. And again, Open Liberty is great for that. We have a start at time of around one second and there's other technologies coming to reduce that uh, um, as well. And then we hit on Quarkus. Quarkus is amazing for functions as a service, especially when you're using native, um, using native code. Because like I said, it can start up in milliseconds. And function as a service, you kind of want it to come up, do its job and then shut down. Um, so Quarkus is amazing for that. And then that scales all the way to microservices as well. So like I mentioned, profiling is a way to kind of dive into your JVM, into the bike uh, code constructs and see the operations that are going on inside. Pardon me. Um, and you can look at things such as garbage collections, object creation, method executions, iterative, iterative executions and thread executions. So Again, if you've never used a profile before, just download one. Um, there are lots of different ones available um, and do go check out what you can do with them. So I, I've used JProfile J Profiler before. I think that's quite a good one. Uh, there's things like your kit, um, Java Visual um, VM, uh, NetBeans, there's the NetBeans profiler. And if you're using the Oracle JDK, you can use Oracle Java Mission Control to um, do your profiling needs. So in regards to tweaking your JVM, um, one of the most important, well, one of the things you should be definitely looking at is tuning your garbage collector to get the most, uh, most efficiency out of it. Um, if your JVM has the ability to use an at-in-time compiler, definitely use that if that technology is not enabled. Um, enable clash data sharing. I'll talk a little bit about this later. And if I have time, um, which I may not, I I'll try and do a very quick demo. Um, OpenJ9 also has something called idle tuning, which is very cool. So if your JVM's sitting there and it's not doing anything, it can lower the amount of resources it's using. Now, again, when we're paying for you know, units of compute, that might not save us any money, but it will save us energy. Um, 
Then we move to the JIT server, which is great because it means you can put basically um, different servers, spread them around, um, which enable you to um, cope with, say, um, constrained memory environments. Um, and also try and start with a small heap size um, and then just increase it as you go along, as you build your application. We all generally start with a big heap size and we never really use it. Um, and this can, you know, make your JVM a lot more efficient. So start with a, this minimum heap size you think is correct for your application. If you run into problems, just keep increasing it. Um, but don't go with some huge heap size because, again, you're just you're just not being efficient there. So open J9 class data sharing. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what this is, and I should have time to give you a very quick demo. Um, so this is a shared class cache, and it's an area of memory of a fixed size that persists beyond the lifetime of the JVM. So you can shut your computer down, et cetera, your application down, um, and this shared class cache will still exist. Um, any number of these can exist on a system. So when you create them, you just put basically, um, when you put the, uh, the JVM option in, um, basically all you do is just give it a different name. Um, it can't grow in size, but you can increase the size of it if you want. Um, but even if it becomes full, um, JVMs can still load classes from it, but they just won't add more to it, basically. Um, and you can create, again, large um, shared class caches up front, um, and while setting a soft maximum limit on how much shared class cache space can be used. And again, you can increase this limit. Um, this is more done from the kind of Linux level. So how does this work? Well, normally the boot, the um, class loads are lookup um, order looks a bit like class loader cache, then you have your parent, then your file system. And in contrast, a JVM that has the class cache sharing feature enabled will do the class loader cache and the parent, so like it normally would, but then it will go to the shared class caches, then the file system. And in the shared class caches, we put all those ca uh, classes in that, um, that we use on startup. And this helps us start up um, our run times and our applications a lot, lot quicker. Um, it's very easy to enable this it's just a jvm uh, property so um, all you need to do is put dash capital x share classes um, if you want different classes on the same j uh, different shared classes on the same jvm all you need to do is give it a different name um, and also you can specify the size of it um, like i said um, increasing it before before you start it so this was this is open liberty um, vanilla open liberty and lots of different runtimes running on the hotspot jvm um, and as you can see we're starting up in about two seconds but if we enable OpenJ9 with class cache sharing, we've got that down by more than 100%. So we're just over a second. But it's not just Open Liberty here. Um, and this is an old version of Open Liberty. Um, we're on um, 0.6 at the moment. Um, but all the other runtimes also have startup savings. So um, Tommy E's reduced by about half a second. Um, Tomcats gets reduced. So even if you're not using Open Liberty, Open J9, and I should be saying summary runtimes as well, um, that can, if you enable this class cache sharing, you will get benefits no matter what runtime you're using. Um, so, and it also has the same effect in Docker containers. So, starting the same application up in a Docker container takes about seven seconds. With this technology enabled, we've got that down to just over two seconds. And the demo I will be showing you in a second um, will be in a Docker container. It's going to be on this online learning environment. Um, so, yeah, it should have a similar kind of um, similar uh, benefits. So, and again, this has been quite a long road and a lot of this has happened because we have um, uh, added open source contributions into the OpenJ9 JVM and also into the Open uh, Liberty project to really try and, you know, reduce this startup time and take advantage of these technologies. Right, so I'm going to try and give you a demo now. Um, you can follow along if you want. Again, this is all an online learning environment. Um, so I'm going to switch to that now. Uh, do, do. Okay, so it'll take you, you can go to the Open Liberty website um, and we have this option to run in cloud on our guides and it'll take you to here, just click access cloud hosted guide and then you've got this kind of learning environment which we have here. Um, I saw a similar one um, that Josh Long was talk using in the previous workshop and essentially it's got everything you need, your instructions on the side, your terminal and this is all running in containers on the cloud, so all the good stuff. Um, and really what I'm going to do is I'm not going to build anything here. Um, I'm going to use an existing application um, to essentially demonstrate um, uh, the benefits we can get of class cache sharing to so the startup time. So the first time I run this, it's going to have to download a load of stuff from Maven. Like the, Again, this is a brand new environment, so it's got nothing loaded into it. Um, but while it's doing all that, um, I'm going to go into... So we're using the finished directory, um, again, just to... Um, 
uh, just, just to demonstrate uh, this working. So in this config, this Liberty config directory, this is where we can create our file. And the file will be called um, jvm.options. Okay, do, do, do. Right, so I'm gonna wait a second, wait for my um, runtime to start up. What we'll see is how long it takes initially to start up. And then I'm gonna enable class, show you a very simply how to enable this technology. And then hopefully we will see some performance benefits. Um, sometimes the demo guards aren't happy about some of these things. So we'll see um, actually what the startup time will be. Um, but hopefully we should see an increase. So do, 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 where is the startup time? Um, completely lost it. So this started up in 12 seconds. So that's the first time I've run this. I'm going to shut this down. And then what I'm going to do is, oh, so it was dash x share classes. So that should automatically save. Awesome. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to restart the application server. And we should hopefully, so the first time this runs, what will happen is it's going to look at all the classes that are used at startup and it's going to populate um, that shared class cache. So initially it may only start a little bit faster, um, but the second time I run this, once it's trained the class cache, it should start up a lot quicker. And you can keep training this over and over again. Um, so now we've got it already down to two seconds. Um, let's see if we can get that down any more. Um, now the class cache has been trained once and again you can keep training it over and over again to keep reducing this now this is all running on a learning environment in containers on the cloud um so it yeah you can already see how much performance benefits i've got from simply just um, enabling this very very simple functionality let's see what it's how quick it starts this time 2.8 seconds so again you can keep running this over and over again and with this technology it will train the uh, shared class cache um, and eventually increase your startup time. And again, this is very important because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, if we all did this around the world, everyone who's using kind of vanilla JVM um, using this, we, we could reduce a lot of energy and a lot of money around the world. Um, I think I might be running out of time, so I'm going to quickly go very quickly through the last part. Um, so this is more about using um, JIT server to remote compilation. Oh, no, first of all, we're going to talk about idle tuning. So idle tuning, like I mentioned, if you're not using the resources on the JVM, um, it can basically um, go into a kind of idle state and reduce how much you're, you're, the memory you're using. Again, when we're paying for this, it works well. Obviously, if we've got our own data centers because it will save us, um, save us a bit of money. But it also works well. I mean, we're paying for our compute units anyway, but it will save energy, um, which is the most important thing, I think, for me. Um, the JIT server is great because it allows you to put different servers that do compilation in different places. Um, and the great thing about this is it can help um, in very memory strained environments. So here's OpenJ9 and OpenJ9 with JIT server enabled. 300 meg environment, about the same. 256 meg environment. OpenJ9 has gone down a little bit, but not too bad. Um, but when we go to a 200 meg environment, you can see OpenJ9 is starting to struggle. The throughput is really going low. And whereas with the JIT server, the throughput is staying, you know, quite high up there. Um, and this is really good because um, it will allow us as developers or DevOps engineers to obviously see there's a problem here and hopefully flag up some alarms and quickly go in and try and fix the problem rather than our application just stop working and our customers not be able to access things. Um, very simple to get JIT server enabled. Um, again, you can um, send requests to the JIT server by the first command, and then you just run the following command to basically just start the JIT server process any way you want. Um, are there any future tech to the rescue? Um, Cryo is something that I think is quite cool. It stands for Checkpoint Restore and User Space. Um, and this basically allows you to kind of take, this uses um, a feature that's on the Linux operating system to enable um, a snapshot um, and to really get your application started very, very quickly. Um, this has amazing benefits, so we've been playing around with this for quite a while. Um, as you can see, we can get the startup time of this application down from one second to about 0.2 seconds, but you really get more benefits out of this the, um, the bigger your application is. So yeah, um, this, keep an eye on this technology um, because it is, I, I know there's other people working on it as well. Um, there are some challenges with Cryo, things such as lack of encryption, um, no address-based layout randomization, predictable random number generators, um, running as non-root user, especially in containers, people don't like that. Um, and no, AP, there's no APIs really to specify when the snapshot should be taken. But these things are all being worked out, so do keep an eye out. 
um, with Open Liberty and other technologies to see um, if you can take advantage of this when it when it's all all done and finished. So a little bit of a recap before we finish. Um, so how do you get the most out of your JVM? Like I said, write efficient code is definitely one of the, mo the most important things as a developer. Um, pick the right JVM for your needs. Look at what you're building. Look at your application and pick that right JVM. Um, pick the runtime that's right for your application because if you don't have the right runtime, then you're not going to get the advantage out of your efficient code and your um, your JVM. Um, use profiling because profiling, even it. Even if you're not planning to do anything with it, just use profiling just to have a look because it's quite amazing what goes on underneath um, underneath our application code. And of course, tweak your JVM. And if we all make these little tweaks to our JVMs, every Java application around the world, um, we can save money for our organization. But again, which is more, um, more to our hearts is saving energy. So doing our bit for the planet. Um, there's some links to some of the materials here. Um, I can't leave this slide up for very long because I'm I think I'm out of time. But um, yeah, do take a snapshot if you want to find out any of this information. Um, and also, there's some links to some of the references because again, like I said, I'm not JVM expert. Um, I had to do quite a lot of um, digging around and looking around for uh, different information about um, JVM. So here's some of the um, links to some of the information I, I used in this talk. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And um, again, sorry I couldn't be there. Um, hopefully next year um, I will be um, if you guys accept one of my talks. But yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions today. And I hope you all have a good time seeing each other in person tomorrow. So yep, yeah, that's it from me. Um, thank you very, very much.